Look, I'm all for it, man. The, the butting heads, the sparring, the trash talk. It fuels endless emotion and brings the very best out of some players. Either you let the trash talk mess with your head, or you take all that smack, absorb it, and spit it right back at the guy. You feel like you can break LeBron at this point? Uh, we broke LeBron. In game five. So get your ass out of here with that, all right? <laughs> you understand how you got the Cleveland, how you got the Miami bill? You remember That's that? true. You broke okay, him in 2010. Okay, so remember that, all right? Fair so enough. stop bringing that up, all right? Fair enough. So they was talking shit to him, okay? <laughs> the media and the league knew that they had an agenda in which we weren't part of the agenda. You understand? Right. Do you think you pushed LeBron too far in game five? Because game six, he's unbelievable. <laughs> you think you gave him the eye of the tiger? Pushed him too far? <laughs> Nothing? Man, listen, let me say something to you. The C's, we didn't give a fuck about LeBron. We didn't fear LeBron, and we didn't think that he can beat all five of us. And that's how I felt. He was trying to consolidate because he didn't want the pressure on him. You understand? That's pretty bold of Kevin Garnett to say. Not because of who he is, but what he actually said. Kevin Garnett is one of the greatest trash talkers in NBA history, but his sentiments that the Celtics quote unquote broke LeBron isn't as black and white as KG made it seem while talking to Bill Simmons here on his podcast. Seven point game, and this is gonna be as bitter an end to a season as you can possibly have. The year the Cavs were supposed to win an NBA championship is gonna end in the second round. The 2010 NBA playoffs marked LeBron's official exit from Cleveland to the Miami Heat, and the Celtics were the ones that kicked LeBron out of the playoffs and left him searching for a way to take down KG, Paul Pierce, and Ray Allen up in Boston. And a way is exactly what LeBron found just weeks later by linking up with D-Wade and Chris Bosh on the Miami Heat. Um, and this fall, I'm gonna take my talents to South Beach and uh, join the Miami Heat. KG said he didn't think that LeBron could beat, and I quote, the five of us. Which, I don't know about you, but I find that as the ultimate compliment saying that you can't beat five people by yourself. Which is also funny, <laughs> KG saying that, because he was the one who moved out of Minnesota and brought Ray Allen along with him to join Paul Pierce on the Celtics, all while a 22-year-old LeBron James was leading his Cleveland Cavaliers to the NBA Finals just four years after the Cavs won an atrocious 17 games before LeBron was drafted. KG's teammate Paul Pierce had years of beef with LeBron, starting from the moment LeBron entered the NBA, and beating LeBron in 2010 only added more fuel to Pierce's trash-talking fire. But when LeBron came back with a squad and it was actually a fair fight, LeBron sent the Celtics home in just five games in the 2011 playoffs. Yet KG claimed that the Celtics broke LeBron. And in the following season, after Paul Pierce started strolling down the court after hitting a three-pointer and had this look on his face, LeBron happened, and the Celtics never happened again. James for three, puts it in. LeBron gets a double-figure game. James tries again and puts it in again. Bosh down low against Ray Allen, turns, little jump hook, won't go. James comes flying this in. This has been one impressive, dominant performance. James flips it up, left-handed, backs it in. He's got 45. And yet KG, I'm going to say it again, claimed that we broke LeBron. Paul's... Look, Paul Pierce still can't stand LeBron and is bitter over what happened during these very years. And Ray Allen just said, hey, let me pack my bags and link up with the King because the three of us cannot match up with LeBron when he has a team that can actually compete with us. You know, there's something about those Celtics, something extra, something bold and boasted about them that has made them this historic franchise no matter which way you slice it. It's Boston, it's green, it's the home of passionate sports fans and even ultra passionate players. And if I were to give my take on it, Larry Bird is the reason why the Celtics have had this force field around them for years and years now. Larry Bird wasn't just one of, he might have been the greatest trash talker in NBA history and a guy that backed up all that smack talk almost always until one night, one super memorable historic night that none of us, certainly not Larry Bird, will ever forget. I don't know what the Celtics of the 1980s and Larry Bird said to Michael Jordan or what MJ heard about them, but clearly he didn't like it. And it's why he went out and got 63 points that night in the garden. I think it's gonna be more of a five-man game and uh, we really have to play a complete basketball game. I, I don't think one man can beat the Boston Celtics. 99% of the time, that statement would have been correct, but when it's Michael Jordan, anything and everything goes. Literally, yes, one man nearly did beat an entire team. On April 20th, 1986, NBA fans watched Game 2 in the first round of the 1986 Eastern Conference playoffs. The 30 and 52 Chicago Bulls, led by a 23-year-old Michael Jordan, versus the 67 and 15 Boston Celtics, led by Larry Bird and a number of A-list stars. It can't be overstated. This was one of the most incredible moments in the history of not just the NBA, 
but the history of sports. The defending champion Boston Celtics had All-Star after All-Star after All-Star, Kevin McHale, Robert Parrish, and Danny Ainge, former league MVP Bill Walton, Dennis Johnson, and of course, Larry Joe Bird, who won that season's MVP and the MVP and the finals MVP in the season before. And the Bulls had, well, Michael Jordan. <laughs> well, we all know MJ went for 63 points in the Boston Garden, including 54 points in regulation. But let me give you the opportunity to really look closely at what transpired that day. It's just mind-bending. A 23-year-old Michael Jordan went into Boston against the team with the best defensive rating and the best net rating in the NBA, and I made out all the numbers. Here's what he did. 12 for 22 on pull-up jumpers, 8 for 14 on drives to the basket, and 2 of 5 on what are described as other shots. He shot 22 of 41 overall from the floor, with only three of those shots being uncontested. 38 of 41 of his shots were shot with a hand in his face. Like, come on, man. <laughs> oh, and he attempted 21 free throws and hit 19 of them, with the two of the most important attempts coming at the end of regulation that MJ, of course, converted to send the game into overtime. Overtime in game two of our best of five first round NBA playoff. And what do you think was Larry Bird's reaction to all of this? The man was notorious for devastating guys with his talking in his game. And he just got 63 hung on him. Was he mad about it? Nah. Jordan with eight on the clock. Jordan oh. ties the game. Oh, boy. 63 points and you're looking at an all-time record. Oh. He couldn't help but fall in deep awe over what he saw. And this is probably the most remarkable reflection of just who and what Michael Jordan was. These are some of the things Larry Bird, a lip sparring champ, had to say about MJ after that game. He says, he obviously was in a zone. He kept him in the game with big basket after big basket. We couldn't stop him. We had about everyone on the team guarding him. And the most revealing and iconic quote of them all, I think he's God disguised as Michael Jordan. He's the most awesome player in the NBA. Today in Boston Garden on national TV in the playoffs, he put on one of the greatest shows of all time. I couldn't believe anybody could do that against the Boston Celtics. Wow. I mean, just wow. Never again will a man who many people saw as the best player in the NBA offer that kind of praise and adulation for some 22-year-old kid. Never. All that trash talk, all that chitter chatter turned into a bunch of praise for MJ. I still can't believe it to this day, and it's been nearly 40 years. Now question, is it a coincidence that the Celtics had beef with two guys in the GOAT conversation? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's just a thought. You tell me.